Hi folks, I'm Spencer and on today's episode of Court Mania we're going to be looking at Adam Wingard's 80s inflected thriller The Guest. Written by Wingard's longtime writing partner Simon Barrett, The Guest follows the Peterson family. They've recently lost their eldest son slash brother in sort of undetermined war and basically things aren't looking very good. But the hole their son has left could be filled when David turns up at their door. David tells them that he is, well, was a squad member in the same squad as their son and that he has come by to check on them. He'd promised, you know, he was there when their son died. He promised he would look after the family. And to begin with, David seems like a godsend. You know, he's helping out around the house. He's you know, beating up the bullies that are harassing the youngest kid. You know, he's 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 a good guy. But, I mean, you can kind of guess where this is going. There's more to David than you might think. People start turning up. Well, not turning up. Things just start to get a bit weird around the Peterson house. Can I help you? Mrs. Peterson? Yes? My name is David. Mrs. Peterson, I, uh, I knew your son, Caleb. Now, as you can probably tell from that plot synopsis, the guest is a very pulpy piece of entertainment, and that is reflected in pretty much everything the film does, but mainly in its sort of acting style and its characters. I mean, the entire Peterson family are just archetypes, really. You have the loving housewife mom, the dad who is struggling to make ends meet and needs a promotion and at every point just turns to someone and goes, I'm getting a beer. You have the son with terrible sort of bowl cut emo hair who is just a massive nerd and you have the sort of angsty, gothy, late teenage daughter. Now, that daughter is Anna, played by Micah Monroe, and at the time that this came out, she, you know, she was really looking like she was going to be the next big sort of genre star, the next big sort of scream queen. And you can tell why, because she's really good in this film. She manages to sort of balance that sort of, ah, oh, I'm angsty and moody and I don't like my parents and my boyfriend is a baddie, you know, he sells drugs and stuff whilst actually being likeable, resourceful. She gets some action sequences later on. She does those really well. She has really jazzy hair. It, she's just got like that quality of like, she's perfect for these sort of throwback 80s inflected films. And I'm really sad that I haven't actually seen her in anything for a while. I know she's been in things, but not in the sort of big things that I think she deserves to be in. But, I mean, no performance in this really compares with Dan Stevens as David. I mean, you know, it's his face that is big on the box and on the back. And he's he's perfect for this sort of role. I mean, you can tell that this was going to be like his big movie break after he'd been in Downton Abbey. And he clearly knows it because he goes for it big time. I mean, he perfectly understands the style of the film, that it is this sort of over-the-top, slightly sort of silly thriller. He, I mean, David is a, you know, he's so, he's like so ridiculously cool, you know, he's proper tough, badass guy. And Dan Simmons does those really well, but I think the more important stuff is that he does the weird you know, right from the start, David is clearly not normal and he manages to pull those scenes off really well because he does them to a degree that you instantly go, right, I don't trust you for a second. But he's also able to keep you invested in him and liking him and wanting to know more. I think it's the fact that all of his cool stuff is really over the top, it's really silly. Whereas 
the weird, creepy stuff is slightly more understated. It, you know, there's lots of scenes where he'll stare and he doesn't blink and you don't notice, but it's just like, it shows that there's something off and it's that leap between, I'm really cool, I'm a bit weird though, that, you know, really work and to be honest, I'd like to see him do more roles like this again. He asked me to check on y'all. And so, we're gonna be good friends. Now, the film's cinematography really helps to build a sort of, a, an atmosphere for the film. Um, it's all shot in widescreen and the locations were all filmed out in New Mexico. And it really adds this sort of strange, sort of frontiery western vibe to it. The, the Peterson house is out in the middle of nowhere and you get lots of shots where you know you've got the house it's just quite small or it takes up like the side of the frame and then you know you've just got this sort of flat expanse these long roads and it, it does sort of help to build this sort of creepy atmosphere. This is sort of helped by the fact that the, the film's set around Halloween so you've got lots of Pumpkins. It has a very John Carpenter vibe to it. They were definitely going for that. You know, you can see that from the, the fonts that they use for the opening titles. A lot of the way characters are framed has that vibe. A lot of the action sequences are shot in, in a similar way to something like Assault on Precinct 13. That's, a, that's probably the, the Carpenter film that jumps out the most from this. Although, you know there are elements of other ones in there and it, I mean it's not it's not like a direct rip-off of Carpenter style there are some fight scenes early on that have like sort of crash zooms bump zooms like you know people turn in and they ding, you go right in and those are really cool because they're just really cheesy and again they sort of give you that vibe there's some sassy like slow motion bits it's a really fun bit with some sheets blowing around and slow-mo and everything again is pitched at this sort of cheesy overly filmy quality but it works also I mean just the the lighting in this film there are you know the finale is all coloured gels and it all just it looks really pretty <laughs> For the damages. Now, the soundtrack for The Guest is also pretty superb. I mean, the actual score itself was recorded by Steve Moore of the band Zombie, and he does a fantastic job. The soundtrack is sort of designed to, I know I keep saying John Carpenter, but it's got, you know, it's definitely taking influence from his work. There is a lot of other sort of 80s action movie type stuff going on here. That includes, you know, there's some, some sort of terminatory motifs. But I think it is very motif driven. You sort of hear in the same themes over and over again, but they build really well. They sort of get darker, they get bassier as the film progresses and it gets weirder and it gets more intense. And I think that really helps you to feel like things are sort of escalating, getting out of hand. And the score is sort of bolstered by being paired with this really effective use of pop scoring. The film has a lot of sort of 80s sort of goth and sort of more modern throwback sort of synthwave stuff. But I think it manages to merge those really well. Again, it's giving you that 80s feeling. And to be honest, they they're just really good songs to listen to. This is one of the first soundtracks I remember buying, and I, I think it's really great. Also, if you are a Stranger Things fan, this film has two tracks by the band Survive, which contained Michael Stein and Carl Dixon that did the Stranger Things music, so it's a cool little like, oh, this is what they were doing before they did that. Fun facts. Most importantly for the film is a beautiful synergy between the sort of sound and vision of the film, most notably in a fantastic scene in which we are listening to 
Emma, by the Sisters of Mercy, as Dan Stevens comes out of a steamy shower half naked and it is one of the greatest moments of sort of gratuitous abs that have ever been in a film. It's magical. Oh yeah! Now, you might think that I'm just trying to be funny by bringing up that moment. And I do love it. That, that is genuine. But it, I'm bringing it up because it perfectly sort of exemplifies what I love so much about the guest. That it was made with one very clear goal. To be entertaining. To just be a fun movie. And it, it, it nails that. And I think that is because you can see that that's what it wants to be all the way through. It, it, the plot is very streamlined. It's the sort of film in which if they want something to happen, they'll just go for it. You know, the ending takes place in one of the most ludicrous locations ever. But you just go with it because the film just sort of goes, oh, that's happening and it moves on, it doesn't try to over-explain itself at any point, it just, you know, it, it's also in the pacing, the film is incredibly brisk, and it front-loads a bunch of the things that you know are going to happen. Like I said, about David beating up the, the bullies that are attacking the, the nerdy son, I mean, that's one of my favourite scenes in the entire film, and it comes up within, like, the first, probably, half an hour because you know you know it's going to happen and it just gives it to you that's actually what it does throughout it clearly knows that there are certain things that you know are going to have to happen and rather than trying to super subvert what you think is going to happen it just goes for them but does them in a big blunt in your face way or rather you know, it's just about delivering what what the trailer promises you, what the poster promises you. It's one of those films that just goes, this is the film you thought you were watching? Yeah, it definitely is. And it's going to be really good. What I would have done if you hadn't been here. Ah! Really, Mrs. Peterson, it's no problem. I mean, you know, there is, there is no build-up. David turns up within the first couple of minutes. You don't even have to wait for the plot to kick in. The plot just kicks in straight away. Now, does all of this stuff mean the film is a bit silly? Yes. It, I mean, it's a very silly film, but it's knowingly silly. All of the cast know that it's a bit ridiculous and a bit stupid, and you can tell that everyone just got on board with that idea. Now, I mean, is that for everyone? Probably not, because some people need their films to be serious and to be about things, and this might come across as just being dumb popcorn entertainment, but, I mean, if that's what you're after, it's brilliant. I mean, I say that as someone who fully appreciates that it, th this film is like someone went in my head found all the things that I like about films and went, that's just a checklist that they have to tick off. You know, it's got dumb action sequences where people just shoot a lot or, you know, it's like that, it's got that scene where bullies get punished. I always love a scene like that. It's got a sort of overly cool anti-hero. It's got a sassy alt girl as the sort of heroine it's got a nerdy kid that you look at and you go that's me that's who i am in this film it's got a sort of john carpenter aesthetic it's got a fantastic soundtrack and it's got dan stevens being really sexy in it it's got everything i could want and if any of those things that i just listed are things that you like in a film then you should watch the guest it will probably appeal to you. I saw this the first time at college in film club and we all loved it. So I think it is the sort of, it's a proper filmy fans film. So yeah, go watch it. But 
that's just my opinion. What do you think of the guest? Are you excited to see that Adam Wingard is directing Godzilla vs Kong? That's why I've reviewed this, because I was like, if he can make a film like The Guest, but make it with big monsters, it'll be one of the best films ever. Let me know down in the comments, like and subscribe so that you don't miss any more videos, and I shall see you next time.